So welcome, <clears throat> welcome everyone to the Gospel of Thomas uh, meeting and great that you're here, that you decided to join and um, so the Gospel of Thomas uh, is a door, it's, it's a portal. That's what I discovered in, in preparing for this or even receiving the idea. I received the idea with, oh, I never heard about it and then started uh, looking at it and yeah I see that doors are opening to to information that I didn't have before and uh, with that uh, pearls and gifts that I yeah I didn't know existed and that's really great and especially with this pretty recently discovered uh, in 1940s it was discovered uh, uh, somewhere in Egypt, the scrolls of Thomas, and um, say investigating it, they were researching it and discovering like, oh my God, these are actually expressions of Jesus of Nazareth. How wonderful is that? And and then yeah, it slowly but certainly say um, was shared in the world. So people were starting to write books about it and all this and putting it together, translating it into English, for instance, and into French and in all kinds of languages in the end. Um, but seeing that where it came from actually was the note, yeah, like a notebook of Thomas. And, and this is great, like Thomas is, yeah, it, Thomas is Thomas. Thomas is one of the disciples of Jesus, but uh, yeah, what do we know about him actually, except that he was doubting. Uh, that's a very limited perspective of one of the disciples, like one of the twelve. So I was like, uh, we're missing something here with the idea of Thomas. Thomas was not just a doubting disciple. And uh, so what does that mean for ourselves in trying to look at it from a whole perspective, you could say, it's like you miss one of the 12 rays in your consciousness in order to get a complete picture of uh, the totality of you. Like you cannot uh, just dismiss um, one of the 12 rays of light that are available. You can say like, well, I like Matthew better or give me Luke. Yeah, Luke was the heal, the healer. And that's interesting. But Thomas, no, he was the doubter. So it's like he does not seem to have a very good reputation in, in the established Christianity, you could say. Um, so that's completely changed. Um, that is completely changing when you actually look at what he is writing down and what he actually did with Jesus. Like he, he was something else in, in the whole, say, uh, alliance of disciples, in the whole brotherhood of disciples. And um, it, it is, like I said, it is a portal. So what you're going to hear in, in the episodes that are coming up and what you're going to discover today, for instance, like to start with it right away, is in fact uh, the portal, Thomas. Like there's really something there for you to open up in yourself that you didn't know was so incredibly, um, yeah, rejuvenating in fact. Like it, it really is like revitalizing something in you. Also, like um, maybe the, the biggest thing is acceptance of yourself. Like he was one of the 12. So he, okay, he, so he did doubt sometimes too. Like, yeah, he had his ups and downs, of course. Does that make him a bad disciple? No, of course not. So this, this um, say, self-image uh, that you see reflected in Thomas is it's great to recognize like hey yeah i can just be myself i really can be myself and still say be a disciple or an apostle if you want it's like i can still be a total part of this it does not have anything to do with my um, difficulties or my limited possibilities or who knows what you think about yourself 
So and I think in that, for that, Thomas is absolutely a portal, a beautiful way to open a door that gives you so much that is that is in fact a, a representation of an maybe denied light that is present in you. So that's that's a different intro than I expected myself to express, but I think it's beautiful because um, it is um, what I discover for myself. It's like, yeah, he okay, he's an analytical mind. He was one of the the best thinkers in in the twelve. He could he had not much education, but he could think really well, and he was very analytical. Maybe even skeptical at times too, and he didn't accept anything without first like giving it some reason and really looking at it. So, yeah. So we we will listen um, to a description of Thomas or a little background story about Thomas that was given in the Urantia. Uh, it's not a book. Urantia actually means like earth um, it is it is a book uh, that I use here because it is one of yeah the very few books that actually have a lot of information about Thomas and I I love to share that so it gives you a real impression in how it was having Thomas uh, yeah having Thomas as one of the twelve so that's why it's good for. So what else are we going to do today? Because, um, yeah, what is actually, how actually do we approach the Gospel of Thomas? Now there is a, a book that uh, was translated, I think, from French into English, from Monsieur Le Loup, and uh, he wrote a beautiful book, actually. I, I went through it. He, he uh, translated it from... Uh, say the Greek language into uh, French, if I got that right. And um, so the thing that happened was that he looked at it. He looked for cross references in the Bible of what uh, Thomas is saying, and he say came with his own background. He read Upanishads and and more like this. Um, came from the East, so to speak, in his, in his spiritual tradition. But um, giving that to us in, an, uh, in a way that is interesting as an, as an angle to look at this. And you see a lot of similarities with what you know from the New Testament, with the letters um, to, to the Philippians, with Matthew, with Luke, with John, with... You know, they're all there. They See, Thomas had specific uh, moments with Jesus. And he had, of course, his own relationship with Jesus. Now, this matured in, in, in the time that he was with him. So he eventually spent a lot of time with Jesus. And he would ask him questions. And he would, yeah. And he made notes of those. And these are actually in, in the... Uh, in the book that we're using. So that's one part. Now, uh, one one of the expressions, so there are probably 130 or something in there. So we, we only do 49 and 50 today because they're very much related, is what I saw. It's like they're very much related, um, but taking two expressions of Jesus and actually diving into the cross-references in the Bible. Now, when when I do that, <laughs> it is it is um, like opening a door after a door after a door. Like, wow! I cannot believe what I'm reading. How beautiful this falls together, and all this, you know, it's like it's a delight to let this come to you. So I hope you can join me in that and uh, how I receive this. Now, one of the expressions I'm reading, I still got this um, video that I made in Cyprus, where uh, where you see actually here the background of a 2,000-year-old mosaic, where probably 
might be that Thomas was walking on it. But anyway, um, I read something while I'm sitting at the beach in a certain kind of object and reading to you um, the 50th expression. So I'm, and then we're looking deeper at it. So that's something you can expect today too. Now, uh, I got it very well organized. You can hear that. It's pretty, pretty, pretty cool to do it this way. I love it. So then after hearing that, we go deeper into the expressions because it is, it is not just enough to, to listen to them. So if you really go for it and you read the commentary, and you reflect on it yourself, something starts to happen. Uh, this makes me exciting, excited because of the recognition that you get with what is actually being shared and how everything always comes back, <laughs> comes back to the same thing, which is the recognition that you're a child of light. Like, yes, 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 I recognize that. I recognize that. Thank you so much. So great. Wonderful. Yes. And in fact, it's like you see it reflected everywhere, no matter where. Look, whether I use quantum physics, whether I use the, the Gospel of Thomas, it doesn't matter. It brings me to the same place because literally it's like in the transparency of uh, my mind, um, of course, my source is radiating right through it. And so the reflections I get are actually giving me that too. They're actually showing me uh, my connectedness to every aspect of creation. Whether I see this in a timely setup as this, or whether I um, discover it in just a biblical phrase that I recognize and is so dear to me, it really does not matter. Ah. Uh. Okay, so we're we're listening first to the Urantia uh, reading. I read in this Urantia. I read the section. See, the Urantia is divided in many many papers. I don't know how many, and this is paper one hundred and thirty nine, and one hundred and thirty nine is about all the apostles. So in one hundred and thirty nine, I read section eight. And this is like a subdivision of that chapter, of that paper. And this is about a Thomas Didymus. From the book Urantia, here a piece about Thomas Didymus, which is, say, the Thomas of the Gospel of Thomas. Thomas Didymus. Thomas was the eighth apostle, and he was chosen by Philip. In later times, he has become known as Doubting Thomas, but his fellow apostles hardly looked upon him as a chronic doubter. True, he was a logical, skeptical type of mind, but he had a form of courageous loyalty which forbade those who knew him intimately to regard him as a, as a trifling skeptic. When Thomas joined the Apostles, he was 29 years old, he was married and had four children. Formerly, he has been a carpenter and stonemason, but latterly he had become a fisherman and resided at Tarichea, situated on the west bank of the Jordan, where it flows out of the Sea of Galilee, and he was regarded as the leading citizen of his little village. He had little education, but he possessed a keen, reasoning mind, and was the son of excellent parents who lived in, at Tiberias. Thomas was, had the one truly analytical mind of the Twelve. He was the real scientist of the apostolic group. 
The early home life of Thomas had been unfortunate. His parents were not altogether happy in their married life, and this was reflected in Thomas' adult experience. He grew up having a very disagreeable and quarrelsome disposition. Even his wife was glad to see him join the Apostles. She was relieved by the thought that her pessimistic husband would be away from home most of the time. Thomas also had a streak of suspicion which made it very difficult to get along peaceably with him. Peter was very much upset by Thomas at first, complaining to his brother Andrew that Thomas was mean, ugly and always suspicious. But the better his associates knew Thomas, the more they liked him. They found he was superbly honest and unflinchingly loyal. He was perfectly sincere and unquestionably truthful, but he was a natural-born fault-finder and had grown up to become a real pessimist. His analytical mind had become cursed with suspicion. He was rapidly losing faith in his fellow man when he became associated with the Twelve and thus came in contact with the noble character of Jesus. This association with the Master began at once to transform Thomas's whole disposition and to effect great changes in his mental reactions to his fellow man. Thomas' really great strength was his superb analytical mind, coupled with his unflinching courage when he had once made up his mind. His great weakness was his suspicious doubting, which he never fully overcame throughout his whole lifetime in the flesh. In the organization of the Twelve, Thomas was assigned to arrange and manage the itinerary, and he was able, an able director of the work and movements of the Apostolic Corps. He was a good executive, an excellent businessman, but he was handicapped by his many moods. He was one man one day and another man the next. He was inclined towards melancholic brooding when he joined the Apostles. But contact with Jesus and the Apostles largely cured him of his morbid introspection. Jesus enjoyed Thomas very much and had many long personal talks with him. His presence among the Apostles was a great comfort to all honest doubters and encouraged many troubled minds to come into the Kingdom, even if they could not wholly understand everything about the spiritual and philosophic faces of the teachings of Jesus. Thomas's membership in the Twelve was a standing declaration that Jesus loved even honest doubters. The other Apostles held Jesus in reference because of some special and outstanding trait of his replete personality, but Thomas revered his Master because of his superbly balanced character. Increasingly, Thomas admired and honored one who was so lovingly merciful, yet so inflexibly just and fair, so firm but never obstinate, so calm but never indifferent, so helpful and so sympathetic, but never meddlesome or dictatorial, so strong but at the same time so gentle, so positive but never rough or rude, so tender but never vacillating, so pure and innocent, but at the same time so virile, aggressive and forceful, so courageous, but never rash or foolhardy, such a lover of nature, but so free of all tendency to revere nature, so humorous and so playful, but so free from levity and frivolity. It was this matchless symmetry of personality that so charmed Thomas, he probably enjoyed the highest intellectual understanding and personality appreciation of Jesus of any of the Twelve. 
In the councils of the Twelve, Thomas was always cautious at forgetting a policy of safety first. But if his conservatism was voted down or overruled, he was always the first fearlessly to move out in execution of the program decided upon. Again and again would he stand out against some project as being foolhardy and presumptuous. He would debate to the bitter end, but when Andrew would put the proposition to a vote, and after the twelve would elect to do what that which he had so strenuously opposed, Thomas was the first to say, let's go. He was a good loser. He did not hold grudges or nurse wounded feelings. Time and again did he oppose letting Jesus expose himself to danger. But when the master would decide to take such risks, always was it Thomas who rallied the apostles with his courageous words. Come on, comrades, let's go and die with him. Thomas was in some respect like Philip. He also wanted to be shown, but his outward expressions of doubt were based on entirely different intellectual operations. Thomas was analytical, not merely skeptical. As far as personal physical courage was concerned, he was one of the bravest among the twelve. Thomas had some very bad days. He was blue and downcast at times. The loss of his twin sister when he was nine years old had occasioned him with much youthful sorrow and had added to his temperamental problems of later life. When Thomas would become despondent, despondent, sometimes it was Nathaniel who helped him to recover, sometimes Peter and not infrequently one of the Alphaeus twins. When he was most depressed, unfortunately, he always tried to avoid coming in direct contact with Jesus. But the master knew all about this and had an understanding sympathy for his apostle when he was thus afflicted with depression and harassed by doubts. Sometimes Thomas would get permission from Andrew to go off by himself for a day or two. But he soon learned that such a course was not wise. He early found that it was the best when he was downhearted to stick close to his work and to remain near his associates. But no matter what happened in his emotional life, he kept right on being an apostle. When the time actually came to move forward, it was always Thomas who said, let's go. Thomas is the great example of a human being who has doubts, faces them and wins. He had a great mind and was he was no carping critic he was a logical thinker he was the acid test of jesus and his fellow apostles if jesus and his work had not been genuine it would not have held a man like thomas from the start to finish he had a keen and sure sense of fact at the first appearance of fraud or deception thomas would have forsaken them Scientists may not fully understand all about Jesus and his work on earth, but there lived and worked with the Master and his human associates, a man whose mind was that of a true scientist, Thomas Didymus, and he believed in Jesus of Nazareth. Thomas had such a time, trying time during the days of trial and crucifixion, he was for a reason in the depths of despair, but he rallied his courage, stuck to, his, to the apostles, and was present with them to welcome Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. For a while he succumbed to his doubting depression, but eventually rallied his faith and courage. He gave wise counsel to the apostles after Pentecost, and when persecution scattered the believers, went to Crete, to Cyprus, the North African coast, and Sicily, 
preaching the glad tidings of the kingdom and baptizing believers. And Thomas continued preaching and baptizing until he was apprehended by the agents of the Roman government and was put to death in Malta. Just a few weeks before he, his death, he had begun the writing of the life and teachings of Jesus. Um, see, there's light and there's light. When my light starts to shine, <laughs> my face becomes all transparent, I guess. So um, this is great. So you see, like, wow, um, did you ever hear the description of Jesus like you just heard in the, uh, in the Urantia? It's like, it's so lovely. Uh, and this is in the description actually of Thomas, but since Thomas was looking at him as that, so lovely, so powerful, yet so gentle and so beautiful, you know, it's like, uh, I, I love to hear that, like it totally touches me to hear it. And um, so you just never know where it comes from. And I haven't used the Urantia much in, in uh, say, in the moments that we come together, but it is a great, uh, say, tool to, to come to the depths of what's actually a recognition of the love for your brother. That's basically where it comes down to. It's like, whatever way that can come to you, whatever is happening, it's always like, just for that to to open yourself up to receive the love that actually is given you by your brother or what you recognize in your brother so that is that to me it's always overwhelming and which is great i love to be overwhelmed with that so here it happens too so that's lovely and now Next part in uh, what I'd love to share with you is the is number say the expression number fifty from the book, um, but I do this a little bit in a different way first, and then afterwards we're going to start really taking a look at it, and only see the the purpose of all of it is the same. It is not that we're going to know everything about Thomas or know everything about this and that. It's like, please, no. Um, the thing that happens here is that there are so many doors opening up in the recognition of the love for each other and for uh, the recognition of the light. Like was, you could even say, like was Thomas a historic figure? Well, it doesn't really matter. Are you an historic figure? Yeah, well, you appear to be walking around here for a moment, but uh, in the end, you're not that either. And it's the same with Thomas, like whatever you can contribute here, uh, whatever you can do in being yourself here, extending the love that you are and recognizing that in your brother, that's everything. That's, that's great. That's wonderful. So that recognition can only happen now. It, it does not have to do with that you know everything about Thomas. So it's just right here. Yeah, whatever we use to, to you know, let us be brought here in order to open up is, is totally, uh, say, supportive or constructive, you could say. Now, some of these expressions that we're going to share from the book from Michel Le Loup, um is is really um, say they're all expressions from Jesus that that uh, Thomas said like okay this is too important I gotta write this down wait a minute Jesus I gotta write this down first because what you're telling me now is is just blowing my mind I'm writing it down so that's that's exactly what he did. He probably did it a little bit later when Jesus already resurrected, as you 
read in the Urantia. And, but it was important to him, that's why he wrote it down. And, and you can imagine why, when you read them. All right, so starting uh, to share a video with you, in which I prepared this a little bit, it's probably a couple of minutes, and then we come back to, uh, to yeah, take another look at the expressions and the commentary. Uh, yes, there are French subtitles here too. The Gospel of Thomas, Expressions of Jesus. It holds true and is revealed within their image. If they ask you who you are, say, we are its children, the beloved of the Father, the living one. If they ask you what is the sign of the Father in you, say, it is movement and it is repose. So it's like, it moves me. What is, where do I come from? I born from the light where the light is born like i'm a whole part of the light i'm completely included in the light i'm that i'm not anything else that is where i come from and it moves me and it brings me rest it completely reposes me so and it's no matter where you are no matter what is going on if people ask you where you come from we are born of light we are born of light. We're not born in the flesh. We are born of light. You recognize that. When you admit it and teach it and demonstrate it, this is exactly what is going on. And this is exactly what is given you. So, and then it is like, that is what moves me. That is what brings me into, that is what brings this into expression. That is what the light is. That's where all the beauty is. And that is what you are. So it has nothing to do with a limited image of sickness and death. <laughs> oh my God, no. So I love this. So thank you so much so far. It's so great to, to share this with you. Can hear you. Okay, so thank you for doing that, for saying that. Um, the great thing here is like, yes, it, it went too fast. You could not follow it. It is too quick. True, but it was in there and that was the setup. So now taking another look at it, um, we have time to, to actually see what it says and, and it takes a bit more time than you 
than you expect. Like, um, it is not just reading through it, uh, is what I'm saying. Expressions of Jesus, Gospel of Thomas, children of light. Okay, so what we just heard was this logion, logion or expression or reason 50. Jeshua said, if they ask you from where you come, say, we were born of the light, there where light is born of light. Now, this of course is an incredible expression and it has many references to and we'll see that later but here is the expression we were born of the light there where light is born of light and this is this is an expression that you could say like that is sounds just like for instance love created me like itself you know love created i am that which created me love created me like itself this is just very much uh, the same expression um but see to me something is opened up as as a uh, symbolic way of expressing this is like it refers to that what has no end it, you come from it while you actually are it and uh, uh, we we've seen this before too like in fact uh, what we uh, say so was it yesterday oh my god time flies um, we were looking at that too it's like it's the alpha and the omega like actually these movements are uh, continuous uh, born of the light being in the light being where light is born of light so yeah that uh, in itself is is an um something to ponder to to feel to take time for to actually see what that means like love created me like itself is one expression from from the course in miracles then it's like love created me like itself is is something that yeah you you get lost in completely if you if you allow that to hear that now this is lovely so this expression is like a koan too so that's another way of saying it where we were born of the light there where light is born of light it holds true and is revealed within their image if they ask you who you are say we are its children the beloved of the father the living one if they ask you what is the sign of the father in you say it is movement and it is repose it is movement, it is, it is peace, all the peace possible. And it, it stands still, like it, it is repose, it is completely at peace, but it, it is moving at the same time. So that's a beautiful expression. Now we're going to look at some biblical references, especially for this one, of course, like with where the light is born of light, and created in the image of the father we are the children like i'm the son of the father the living one um, would bring back a lot of references to bible of course you like you recognize this from what is written in the scripture sorry for that so here to mention a, a couple like i i i looked these up and i copied them for you like in here just see what happens with you if these references are read to you when you discover actually what they say it's like it's amazing to me what happens and if a man says any sorry i'll keep my hands off my mouse here if a man says anything to you say to him they are needed by our lord and immediately he will send them here but they did not have a son. This is Luke 1 to 7. They did not have a son because Elizabeth was infertile and both of them were advanced in their ages. Like, okay. I'm not saying anything. Luke 16, 8. And our Lord praised the evil steward because he acted wisely 
for the children of this world in this their generation are wiser than the children of light that's an interesting expression too see what it says the children of this world in this their generation are wiser than the children of light Luke 17 so also you whenever you have done all those things that were commanded of you you should say we are unprofitable servants because we have done that which we were obligated to do like we take no credit for what we do we don't have to take any credit for it john 3 8 for the father himself loves you because you have loved me this is what jesus said for the father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that i have come forth from union with god you recognize your oneness like you recognize the oneness of the christ with god if you recognize that as as an reality it is so for you for i have proceeded from union with the father and i have come into the world and again i leave the world and i'm going to join the father John 8, Joshua answered and said to them, even if I test about myself, testify about myself, my testimony is true, because I know from where I have come and where I am going. You know, this is the light re uh, reference. I know where I come from and I know where I'm going, but you do not know from where I have come and where I am going. John 12, while the light is in you, believe in the light that you might be the children of light. While the light is with you, believe in the light that you might be the children of light. See how many references there are, it's unbelievable. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in our Lord therefore so walk as children of light and 1 Thessalonians 5 for you are all children of light and children of the day and you are not children of the night neither children of darkness Romans 9 for it shall be in place where they were called not my people there they shall be called children of the living god romans 8 14 for those who are led by the spirit of god these are the sons of god for those who are led by the spirit of god these are the sons of god that's the simplicity in fact of listening Oh yeah. Now here is the commentary of the of the writer of the book Monsieur Le Loup, as I call him here. In a famous conversation with the philosopher Motofilov, who came to visit him in his hermitage, Saint Seraphim, said that gnosis, gnosis is an experience of light. But his discourse was not about the nature of light, it was about the participation in its uncreated radiance. For St. Gregory, Palamas, and the monks of Mount Atmos, Athos, the very goal of Christian life is the experience of the uncreated light. They related to the stories of the burning bush, Mount Tabor, and the day of resurrection. It holds true the login tells us like the inner meaning of easter morning this recalls a passage from the chando chandogya upanishad 
with the numbers. The light which shines from beyond the sky, beyond the highest of the highest worlds, beyond everything that is, is the truth, is in truth the same light that shines inside human beingness. The ancient triple question, where do I come from? Where am I going? Who am I? Finds an unequivocal response in this logion. You come from the light. You are going toward the light. You are the light. This is the reality of the living sun in us, who abides in, every, in the very heart of changing appearances. The sign of our link with this luminous reality is movement and repose. This is a union of opposites, the resolution of the seeming contradiction between action, contemplation, calmness within action, vitality within repose. So it is like a dance. <laughs> It brings you this, it is bringing opposites together. It is so the end of a dualistic way of thinking. It brings you back to your nature. It, it brings you back to the light. It, it say, gives you the opportunity to join in that light. You know, it's like everything is um, coming back to that. And especially in this moment of your transformation, you hear about this continuously. I'm expressing this in all kinds of ways, but it's like, yeah, now it comes closer and closer to you to see that as your reality and to say, recognize yourself as a child of light more than anything else. Who cares about the rest in that sense? Like who cares about this world or any form of limitation that you see imposed when you hold on to what you are not? So the transformative um, say capacity or the healing capacity you could say of these expressions are without limit because literally you you have every opportunity to let this speak to you and help you to recognize uh, your true essence you could say and that's what i love about these like uh, one way or another it is um, spending time with them or letting them come to you, letting them talk to you is really the invitation of this, um, spending time with it in, in, in the sense of, yeah, read it over and over. Yeah, read some of the biblical references. I, I read them to you now, but stay with some of them and see what they're actually telling you. Because it, in fact, it is all a possibility for this communication. And suddenly there it is. And suddenly it takes you, and, and this one moment in which it takes you, you could say, is everything. That's literally the salvation of the world, if you want. It's like, that's the occurrence, that is what is, um, what is given, that is what is real about you. So, it is not any other thing. <laughs> so I love that. I really think it's it's beautiful the way this is expressed in in the logians as, as we see it and in the commentary too. I love it. So um, yeah, when I read this like in uh, this logian fifty, uh, I looked back at forty nine and some way or another that was a necessary step too. You will see it when I start reading it, and you see also the references as well as the commentary. The commentary has a very interesting, um, say, connotation regarding monkship uh, that puts it right in a whole different perspective altogether. Um, so the, the expression that's being used, that's the Greek word for monk, I don't know exactly what it is, we'll read it in a second, but it, it literally is, an, uh, uh, say, an expression of wholeness, like whole instead of anything else so it's like you in your monkship you could say like it's whole mindedness you come to an to your 
wholeness, your oneness. And and that's a nice. I never heard that before, but I I love it to to uh, say uh, see it like that. Logan forty nine. Jeshua said, Blessed are you, the whole ones and the chosen ones. You will find the kingdom, for you came from there and you will return. Blessed are you, the whole ones and the chosen ones. You will find the kingdom, for you came from there and you will return. See, there's no sense of accomplishment here. It is a recognition of what already is. I think that's the greatest in this expression. You are blessed. Recognizing that you're one. Say, one of us. Like, you're one. That you are chosen and that you have answered. This will give you the kingdom because you came from there like however we see this in other biblical references too is like however could you return to something that you were not part of before that would be impossible okay so i'm not no wait sorry i pressed the wrong button <laughs> And finally, I can use my mouse. Here it is. So the biblical references first. Um, John 8. Jeshua said unto them, If God were your father, would you have loved me? You would have loved me. For I have proceeded from God and have not come for my own pleasure, but he has sent me. And this is something else listen to this like Jeshua said unto them if God were your father you would have loved me for I have proceeded from God and have not come of my own pleasure but he has sent me I love that can you feel the way this is formulated like it says, if, if God were your father, you would have loved me. See, it is all pointing at a recognition, the recognition of your Christhood or the recognition of seeing um, where you are coming from and recognizing that there is just one of us instead of something else. That's what I love about this. And then you see this back in the low gen too, of course. If God were your father, you would have loved me, for I have proceeded from God and have not come of my own pleasure. But he has sent me. It's like, well, I know better places than to come to planet Earth. <laughs> I know better places to go to. Um, so it was not for my own pleasure that I was here. No, I was sent here. Okay. Which, sorry. John 16. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come forth from union with God. For I have proceeded from union with the Father and I have come into the world and again I leave the world and I'm going to join the Father. See, that's also a circular description. You could say, like, if you want to see it as form, you see the you see the um, mosaic uh, shining through the background. You know, this is like an infinite loop. You see that the expressions that we're sharing are actually exactly the same. So it's like it's inspired by an an endless loop. You could say um, of circles. Uh, which come back like the Alpha and the Omega are one it comes back it is it is oneness it is not um, yeah it's not a cross or anything no it, there's a continuity in it that is something else 
For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come forth from union with God. So here's your inclusion in that love. That's what it says here in John 16. I love it. It's just amazing. So here's the commentary of Monsieur Le Loup. Blessed and fortunate are the monakos. Monakos? That's the Greek word and for monks. And we have translated this word as simple or whole rather than as monks or those in solitude. So it's like whole mindedness, simple, the simple ones, the simple ones or the whole ones. Like oneness is simple, it is not complex. Complexity is of the, the human mind, the ego mind. Blessed and fortunate are the monacos. We have translated this word as simple and whole, rather than as monks or those in solitude. Solitude is one only condition, the condition of this process of unification of all our being, so that we become truly uh, undivided and monos, the image of the one. The monacos are simultaneously separate from all and one with all, as Evagrius Ponticus said. It is the solitude that opens into the heart of the world that intercedes for the salvation of all beings. The monacos seek and find the one who reigns in all and everything, the root and the end, yeah, the Alpha and the Omega. To be chosen over and over again is to open to this great wave of life that is vibrating through us from head to toe, from birth to death. It is the one with Alpha and Omega. It is the Alpha and the Omega. So uh, the recognition of the Alpha and the Omega is like, well, there's this movement in that too. It's like, yeah, the, the beginning and the end come together as as one because it is one like the the truth is not um, divided into a beginning and an end so the eternity like eternity as a movement like this too it's not different than than the background that i say chose here for the for the class it's like it there's a movement in there of eternity and that as a sign is of course interesting but as an experience of seeing that it actually works like that could only be seen in this moment and and not any other time like it's not going to happen in the future now this is the same with with thomas then it's like he appeared and he's appearing as we speak and to come and bring this to us in time like we literally um, see him as one of us since since he is and the love for him is his love for his master. The love for his master is the love of the master for the for God. And and so it is like my love for God. See how how say it's so um, integrated. You could say it's so part of you. If you start to recognize that, you see it literally everywhere. And, and this cannot be uh, experienced enough, like you would want to expand this experience forever. And that is, of course, what is happening. Like there is no opposite to that. <laughs> I try to not express it in the same words as I use, but it seems to be so recognizable that it comes down to it it's just totally amazing i love that it's great it's great so well thank you thomas for bringing this in and um, thank you for um, hearing about your relationship with with jesus and with your other apostles and with your wife who was happy that you turned to be out to be an apostle and had to go for some time like yeah yeah you go to this jesus that's 
<laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, come back. Yeah, yeah, take your time. Why not? I was like, well, that was very, very helpful for the atmosphere in the house at certain points. Um, but anyway, that was more like a joke. So thank you so much for your attention here uh, with um, Thomas and say all the aspects of it that we looked at today. So there are more expressions and uh, so it's it's great to use the book um, because it's it's a great um, yeah, book for study of study is not really the word I want to use more like if you read enough of these logins and you stick with them, you see how they start to affect you and and help you to let go of anything that you think is in the way of fully uh, joining in um, in your communication with your source. So that's great. And next week we will follow up with some more expressions and who knows what will happen then in expressing that. So thank you so much for being part of this and I hope to see you soon. Thank you for that.